that note there unspoken. Yep. Amen. You want to have surgery on your hand? The 15th? That's your left hand. Huh? Oh, that's her left hand. What are you having? Carpal tunnel? Oh. Yeah, Rita had that. She went in, they put a little bitty slit about, I don't know, half inch wide. Took them 15 minutes. Cost her like nineteen hundred dollars, man, for fifteen minutes. Well, the insurance paid it, but but I mean, he was in there fifteen minutes, man. I mean, and he had them lined up, and he looked like cattle going into a chute, man, one right after the other. But he was spitting them in and out of there. <laughs> I said, boy, man, that's a job now. <laughs> but they got it down to where they get get used to, man. They'd split you here, split you here, and it took you forever to heal. In six weeks, man, she was using her hand like, like she'd never had nothing wrong with it. It's amazing what they can do. Thank God for that. Anyone else? Huh? Yeah, I just remember Sally. They said she got like 300 and some cars, man. Huh? Bad. <laughs> She's special. Anyone else? That's a good concert we had last night, wasn't it? Hers are awesome, they're so good to hear. And I tell you what, old Tracy come a long ways from last year, buddy. Yes, he did. God has blessed him. But it was good to see him here last night. It's a blessing. All the good Baptists are coming in now. <laughs> All mine's clear? Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just praise you this morning for this opportunity we have to come into our Sunday school hour, God. And Father, we just ask your blessing to be upon each one that has come. Heavenly Father, we just ask as we go through your word that your spirit would lead us, God. And Heavenly Father, that we could just uh, take it to our heart, Lord, and Father, let it find its root there, God, and spring up and bring forth fruit unto you. Father, we pray for all the requests that have been lifted up to you this morning. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would just touch each one of them in a special way. And Heavenly Father, those that are sick, that you would heal them, Lord, and they could come back and, Father, worship with us here, God, and that we could glorify thy name together. Father, we pray for our pastor, our associate pastor, that you would just help them, God, as they lead this church. and. Father, that we could just be your sheep of your pasture, God, and your spirit would lead us down the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Father, we thank you, God, for each one that's came out. Father, bless all their mothers that are among us this morning as we celebrate their day. And Father, we ask all of this in Christ's name we pray, and amen. And we would like to wish all the mothers happy Mother's Day this morning. Uh, it is your day of celebration. I uh, hope you're well taken care of today by your offspring. And uh, uh, Cody and Josh just brought Rita over a big old thing of hanging plants this morning and hung them on, on their porch. And uh, they always do that on Mother's Day. They go get her, they got hangers out on their front porch and uh, they got her flowers this morning. Uh, so we thank God for that. Thank God for all the mothers that are here because if it wasn't for the mothers, we wouldn't be here. Uh, you know, it's God's design for us and uh, we thank God for you this morning. Let's look at our lesson this morning. We're going to talk about hope. Hope is something that you have that God has given each one of us. Uh, like when we left the house this morning, we had a hope in our heart that we would arrive at that parking lot. And so, and when the Bible says that when, when you're on a journey, uh, you know, you have hope, but then when you get to where you're going, 
then you, that hope has is, is become a reality. Uh, and this morning when we stepped out in that parking lot, our hope diminished because we made it. We're here. Uh, so we have a hope in God. Uh, that hope never runs out. It goes, takes you from the time that you were saved by the grace of God. Uh, it takes you all the way to the portal of glory. And that's that hope that God has given us. One of these days, our hope is going to come a reality uh, in, in each one of us. And uh, today, but we walk by faith. Uh, and that faith is uh, sustained by the love that God has put in our heart. Because love is the engine of faith. If you love God, then you're going to trust God. Uh, and so uh, as we go down life's way and we look at this morning at David, and we, we know that David uh, was a man after God's own heart. Uh, God used him in a mighty way. Uh, David was a man that challenged God. God was a, ma a God that challenged David. Uh, and, and, and we see that with David's writings that uh, his hope was in the Lord, uh, and, and that hope was not deferred. Uh, he was grateful, and we're going to talk about gratitude this morning. Uh, gratitude is our response to the hope we have in Christ. Are you grateful of what God has did for you in Christ? Uh, do you praise God? Do you thank God that he gave his son Jesus Christ that you could have life and have it more abundantly? How often we do that. Uh, Christians need to do it daily. I mean, it's, it's a continuous thing. Uh, we are supposed to have psalms upon our heart continuously. The Bible says if you're happy, sing. You know, but if you're saddened, then we pray. And we ask God, it strengthens us and it helps us. Uh, so let's look at our lesson today. and We're in, in, in Psalms 138, uh, and it's only got eight verses in it, and we're going to cover all eight verses. Uh, but this is a psalm of David. It was a song that uh, they used to uh, sing before the Lord. And it says, and I will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods. I will bring praise unto thee. I will worship toward the holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. In the day when I crieth, uh, thou answereth me and strengtheneth me with strength in my soul. And David, David is praising God. David has come a long way. Uh, uh, he has been on a journey now with God for a long time in Psalms 138. Uh, and David is strengthened by God. David said, I will praise thee among all the gods. And we know that David was a warrior uh, because he did what he did with Uriah. God said, the sword will never pass from you. So David was a warrior. Uh, so David conquered uh, many little countries. And they had idols they, they, most of the time they had idols they did not worship the true and living God but God said I will praise your name before all these gods David would not uh, turn his back on God and serve the other gods like Israel did several times in the Old Testament uh, they would go into a country of, you know and they had lived there for a while and all of a sudden they'd start erecting up groves and high places and then they'd be offering up sacrifices to their idols uh, you know God would have to reprimand them and get them back online again and but David was a man after God's own heart. David uh, uh, always went in and he said, I will proclaim God's name among all those little gods that those people serve. People serve all kinds of stuff, don't they? They try to make an image of something and they try to serve it. Uh, you know, a, a, a people could even make an image of Jesus and serve the image. Did you know that? And, they, and rather than serving the Christ that's in their heart and never be converted, they'll try to serve a an image of something rather than serving the true and living God. Uh, so we are to serve God with our heart and with our soul and with our spirit. Uh, we are born of God by our spirit, and our spirit, uh, it longs after God because it is joined to God. It becomes one with God, and God becomes one with us. And so we worship God in spirit and in truth by our spirit. The flesh don't understand God. I mean, we we try to understand God in the flesh sometimes with our intellect, with our IQ. Uh, you know, God's above our intellect and God's above our IQ. And that's why God wants us to worship him and serve him by faith and trust him by what he says. Uh, David said that his, his word is above all his names. See, and without the word of God, you can't have faith. Because it takes the word of God for you to have faith because faith cometh by hearing. 
If you don't hear God speak to you, then you can't have faith in God. And he has to speak to you. How does God speak to you? Through his word. I mean, the only way you know God, God does not audibly speak to people today. Uh, God speaks to your heart. And and it's like Elijah said, uh, he said the fire came and the wind came. He said God wasn't in that. But he said when that still small voice come, then he knew it was God. And that's how God speaks to us. You just know something. When God, when God wants to speak to you, he enlightens you. In the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. So when God wants you to know something, it, you just know it. Because God speaks to your heart. He gives you the understanding that you need, and you just know that it's true. It's like a still, small voice that God speaks to your heart with. So his word is above all his name. And we know that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory which is the glory of the only begotten of God. And so we are born of God in that way. We are God's begotten. We are begotten. Paul said, I have begotten you through the word, through the gospel of the word. And so we are begotten of God. And so how are, what does begotten mean? God, begotten means that you're born again. It, it's a born again relationship that we have with God. And we are begotten through the gospel. We hear God speak. God gives us the faith to believe. God tries that faith, and it becomes our faith. You are saved when you believe God is who he says he is. That's how where salvation comes from. You can't just serve a God that you don't know. God has to relate himself to you. When he come to Abraham, he told Abraham, get your stuff, get up, and move out. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a country. Go somewhere where I wanna, I'm going to show you. And the Bible says that Abraham did not waver from God. He heard God. He heard God speak. God gave him the faith that he needed, and, and he trusted God. When you hear God speak through his word, when his word speaks to you and truly speaks to your heart, then God gives you enough faith to believe that it's true, and you believe that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And so that's how we seek God. We seek God by our faith. It is by the word of God. is above all his name. God has many names, but his, his word is above all his name. Uh, your word is your name. Did you know that? You are as good as your word is. If, and, and, you know, we've talked about this several times. Back when my dad was growing up, they never had such thing as a signed contract. There was no such thing. Uh, in, 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 in legal documents, you had a signed contract. But, but, but communication between a man and a man, they never had no written contract because if a man said he's going to do something, he would do it because his word was him. It was his life. And now you can take, I mean, even right here building this church, we had a signed contract. But we had to fight tooth and nails to get this church built. Because we, if, they, they had, if you get a lawyer to sign a contract, they got a lawyer to show them how, how, where you made a mistake by signing that contract. And so they try to get out of it. So today, a lot of times men's word don't mean it, mean it mean like it did back when. But God, God's word never changes. When God says something, it's guaranteed. God said, I said it, and I will do it. And, 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 and God always does that. But men tries to get out of a lot of things that they say or a lot of things that they say they will do. And he said, in the day when I cry, thou answereth me and strengtheneth me with strength in my soul. Have you ever been broken in your soul? Have you ever been broken to your soul? If you are contrary to the will of God if you do something and, and, and all of a sudden the spirit of God just enlightens you. All of a sudden you just realize that you did something and you see yourself the way God sees you. He enlightens you. It breaks you. It breaks your spirit. And it wounds you. And when you're wounded and, 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 and into your soul, it is a wound that only God can heal. Humanity cannot heal a wound of the soul. It only takes God to heal that wound. Uh, I've seen people that people, other people have hurt them, and they're wounded to the soul. And a lot of relationships are broken because of that in, in today's world. And when you get broke to your soul, I mean, you're broke. And it takes God to put that back together again. That's why I believe a lot of marriages today fall apart, because people get wounded and they get hurt. And, 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 it, and it's a hurt that only God can help, but they don't have God in their life and soul. Then all of a sudden something happens, and, it, and it, it's a breakdown and, and, and in our world today. But God strengthens us. He gives us that strength. 
if you have the integrity, if you have the gratitude, if you have the hope and the love that God, God ministers to his people, and if you get it beforehand, you cannot get all this stuff in the time of a bad situation. It has to be got before that you ever get to where uh, uh, you, you're having trouble in your life. A lot of people, that they, they shun God when in, in the good times. They don't build on their foundation that the way they should build on their foundation. Well, when they get to a circumstance and God tries their heart, if they ain't got nothing but hay, wood, and stubble in their life, then all that stuff burns up. You ain't got nothing to stand on. You ain't got nothing to hold on to. And so God wants you to sow seeds back here in order to have a harvest up here. And, and everybody's getting ready to plant a garden right now. It's Mother's Day. Everybody's putting plants in the garden, or in their garden. Well, you ain't going to reap that garden until September, maybe the end of August or September. And, and, but you are, you are anticipating on reaping because if you didn't, you wouldn't sow. Is that right? I mean, I wouldn't put out a tomato plant that I didn't think was going to bear me tomatoes. That's for sure. And, uh, and so God is like that. God wants you to sow to your harvest. And, but people, they won't sow to the harvest. But when they get to the circumstance, they would, oh, God. God said, well, you ain't got nothing planted. If you plant hay, wood, and stubble back here or thorns and thistles, what are you going to reap when you get to the harvest? You know, it would be a sad thing for you to put out hogweed and ragweed and all that stuff in your garden, and then you want to go out there and reap some corn on a cob or tomatoes or cucumbers and stuff, wouldn't it? See, but we see, we look at the natural things that God has given us, and we know better to do it in the natural, but in the spiritual, we do it all the time. And people don't even think about it. See, but David, David is strengthened because David is, as, as he's going with God and he's trying God's heart, David does things that sometimes that wasn't kosher with God. But you know what? David would always repent. When God showed him what David did wrong, David had a penitent heart, and he would always repent. And that's what God's looking for. See, it's not the failure that destroys you. It's, it, it's, it's not willing to learn from that failure that destroys you. And, but if we're willing to learn from it, then, then it's a lesson learned. Now you can help someone else in the same situation that they're going through. And that's what we are. We're testimonies of what God has did in our life. And, and God has taken us on a journey. And we got, to, we got to prepare ourselves for that journey. Next page on page 142. It talks about passion, openness, and expression. Passion. Passion. What is passion? When you have a passion for something, you spend a lot of time with it, don't you? It's a desire. That you, it's, a, it's a desire that you have for someone or something. See, I have a passion for golf. I like to play golf. You know, I have a passion to come to church. I like to come to church. You know, a passion for my wife. I love being in the presence of my wife. And, and we have passions. We have a desire to be somewhere. And, and do you have a passion for the Spirit of God to move in your life? It's a passion. It's a love. It's a desire that you have for God to move. And, and, and David had that. He, 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 he had that passion in his life. Notice the emphatic uh, uh, nature of David's praise. He praised and thanked. Uh, uh, thanks were expressed with all his heart. Many times we see David crying out to God. And David would say things, Lord, deliver me from my enemy. Lord, save me. I mean, how many times do you read in Psalms where God, David cried out and said, God, save me? Well, he don't mean that he's getting saved over and over and over again. But he was going into somewhere where that David was, had fear in his heart, and he was asking God to save him from his enemy. Uh, and, and David walked through the valleys of shadow of death a lot of times. But it was only the shadow of death. See, death shadows all of us. Everything that the devil puts against us, and when he comes against us in our spiritual life, it's just a shadow. It's not, it's not something that is real in our life because the things that we conjure up in our flesh that detours us from doing the will of God is just a shadow of life. But it's not nothing that can destroy you if you have faith to believe in God and to trust in God. And so David walked through that valley of shadow of death many times. And he always cried out to God, and God always delivered him. 
And David, David learned from that. And David had a passion for God. And so, in, in, in openness. And David was very open with God. When Nathan pointed out what he did with Bathsheba, and, and he, when he come to him, and when he realized, when he come to him with that little story about the sheep, and David realized that Nathan was talking about him, buddy, David fell on his face before God, and he said, I've sinned. And you, you know the Bible tells us that uh, God uh, uh, forgave David of all his sins, and he never dealt with him with all his sins except with Uriah. And God said he punished him for that. And David, David was punished because of that. But David forgave him of everything that David ever did with his heart because he poured his heart out with God. And, 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 and God dealt with David the way, way that he deals with me and you if we pour our heart out to God. But today, people are proud. They don't want to pour their heart out to God. With the bombardment that we have coming from the world and from the television world and seeing it being poured in on us like a, out of a bucket, you know, sometimes we get callous and we get hardened and, 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 and we come to a place that where sin does not convict no more. And, and, and when we get like that, then we have a heart that turns more toward the world than turning toward God. And so God wants us to stay, stay soft and God wants us to be tender and God wants us to be open with sin because sin is something that destroys your relationship with God. And, and, it, and, it, it, and it takes away from the blessings of God. And so we got to be open with God. And we got to tell him what our life is. God already knows what we are. He already knows. If you, if you did something last week that, that, that was not right in the word of God or was not right with the will of God, God already knows you did it. He knows when you did it. Because God said, I am everywhere. I see everything. And, and you can do nothing that I do not know. God already knows it. So why does God want us to repent? He just wants you to admit it. That's all. He already knows that you did it. And the penalty is already on you. All he wants you to do is recognize it. And, 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 and God can forgive you of what you have done. And no matter what it is, the only sin that cannot be forgiven is unbelief. I mean, if you can't believe God can't heal something, then, then it's unbelief. And, and if, you can't, if you don't have the faith to believe that God can do something, then why would God do it? See, because he wants us to have faith. And the Bible tells us without faith it's impossible to please God. And by faith we believe that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him, that love him with all their heart. Expression. How do you express your love that you have for God? How do you express your love that you have for each other? How do we express our love? You know, does love come from the mouth? You know, say, I love you. You know, does it? You know, you can lie like a dog. <laughs> I mean, you can lie. Oh, brother, I love you when by behind your back I've got a knife. <laughs> I mean, you know, words are cheap. You know, you can say anything. You can say, I love God. You can sit here this morning and say, I love God. But in your doings, you could hate God. See, and so, so it's an expression that God wants us to express. But love goes deeper than words. Love is words. Do you love to hear I love you? I love you brother. I love you sister. I love you husband. I love you wife. Yes, we love to hear the word I love you. We love to, but more than words. Do you have to tell your kids you love them? No. You don't. It's nice to tell your kids you love them. But you don't have to tell your kid you love it. Your kid knows you love them. They know it. See, God does not have to say, I love you. But we know that he loves us. How do we know he, love, we, he loves us? How do we know that? Because we see what he has done for creation. See, creation failed because of sin. But God's love abounded more than sin. And God sent his only son to be born of a woman, born under the law, under the curse, to redeem in you that was under the law, which was, which was a recognition of sin. The law helps you to know what sin is. Without the law, you would not know sin, which is the Word of God, and the Word of God tells you what sin is, and that's how you know what sin is. But see, people 
have lost the original uh, 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 creation of when God created man. And if you lose the beginning, then you don't know what the middle is and the end is. See, because it's a whole book. It's from the beginning to the end. And so the original sin takes you to the middle of the book where the cross of Calvary is, and then the rest of the book is how, how he delivered you from sin. Get out of it. And, and, and that's what God wants me and you to do. And so God wants me and you to recognize that the original sin, in Adam we all die, but in Christ we're all made alive. And God wants you to recognize that. And so when, when you recognize that, you know in your flesh is no good thing. Paul, Paul said that in Romans. He said, I know in my flesh is no good thing. And so you can't serve God with your flesh, but you've got to serve God with your spirit. And you've got to keep your own flesh in subjection. Your flesh, God has given to you. It is yours. This is the only one I'm going to get. I've got to take care of it. And so that has to be in line with the spirit of God. When the spirit leads the flesh, you're in good shape. But when your flesh tries to lead your spirit, you're in bad shape. And we, and we see that all the way through the scriptures. And, and, and see, that's, that's why God wrote it in twos. It's always in twos. Like Esau and Jacob. Like Abraham, Abram and Abraham. Like uh, Jacob and Israel. God deals in twos because God always knows that there's an old man, there's a new man. And God told Rebekah, he said, the younger is going to dominate the older. The elder is going to serve the younger. And so you, me, we have to serve the Christ that's in us. He is the younger of us. And so we have to submit to him. And when you listen to him, you can please God. But when you don't listen to him, guess what? You're going to get a whipping. Because God said, I will discipline those that I love. And so God helps us. How many times do you think God whipped David? A lot. See, David, David did a lot of things. I mean, he... He, he, he did things and he, that he had a good heart toward God. But you know, sometimes he did things the wrong way. And David had to get reprimanded. God reprimanded David. And David always come back when he saw what he did in the eyes of God. He always come back and he always repented before God. Four through six. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O God, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. Through the Lord, though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. But the proud he knoweth afar off. Now, all the kings of the earth will praise thee. What do you think David is talking about? All the kings of the earth is going to praise you. See, David is on a journey. God has got him on a journey, and he's going. When Israel started having trouble, David was in the forefront. David went there, God would demand him, and he would ask God sometimes, do you want me to go take them? And the word of the Lord would come and say, go take them, and I will give them to you. And David would go in and he would take them. Well, when David went in and when he, when he took this little country, he said, all the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O God, when they hear the words of thy mouth. See, because David would always ask the prophet. Is it good for us to go down or not? The prophet would say yes. Well, when they get down there, they would hear the prophet. And so they were going to hear God speak. And they'd say, all these kings are going to recognize that you are the only God. And they were going to recognize that. And that's what David is singing unto God. Well, when you, when you witness to somebody, they are in captivity of sin. They are in the control of Satan. They are in control of the world. The world has control of them. Uh, they have, the, the flesh has control over them. Okay, when you go in and challenge that person, you got to get through all their kings. You got to get through all the things that has got them messed up in the first place. See, you can't, sometimes it's, sometimes you'll get a person that's ready, somebody else has already did all the weed whacking in their life, and you get to them, and, and all of a sudden you can just lead them to the Lord just like that. Oh, man, man, you feel real good at that. But then you get somebody that's going to take you five years to get them saved. You're going to have to live right in front of them. You're going to have to talk right. You're going to have to do right. I mean, it, it takes a long time because you've got to get all the things in their life out in order for them to see where God is so they could praise his holy name. 
Now, all their kings is going to praise. When you witness to somebody and you help them to lead them out of the darkness and into the glorious light, let me tell you something. When they look back and see where they come from, bro, they're going to praise you. They're going to thank God for you, that they had a servant in their life that would, would cultivate their life and hoe out their life and weed whack where they needed to weed whack and, and, and prune where they needed to prune and get all those things out that was separating them from the love of God. And, 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 and when they do that, then David said, all the kings is going to praise you. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, and for great is the glory of the Lord. The one thing that God wants to do is to save everybody. You believe that? Everybody is a potential Christian, but everybody cannot be a Christian. But they're a potential Christian. Everybody ain't going to get saved. We know that. But does that detour us from uh, lifting the glory of God up in their life? It shouldn't. See, do you know who's going to be saved and who ain't going to be saved? I don't. Everybody's a potential Christian, and that's what I got to look at. I don't care who they are. They could be, they could be Buddha. They could be Islam. You know, they could even be a, a Baptist. Everybody's a potential Christian. See, so we got to live a life in front of everybody as though they're a child of God because God loves everybody. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. We are God's creation. I don't care whether you're born in Arabia or Russia or America or Israel. I don't care where you're born at. We are the children of God. God created every single one of us. God has given you a life that whether you can, uh, uh, you can live this way or that way or any way you want to live because God's given you a life. It's yours. God's given it to you. It's a gift of God. If you want to serve the world, you serve the world. If you want to serve Satan, you serve Satan. You know, people can serve a church. Right? People serve all kinds of things. Or you could come to the realization that you need a change in your life and that you need to be reborn in your life because the Word of God has shown you and you could believe what God has said in His Word and you could receive that with gladness in your heart. And when you receive the Word of God in your life, it's going to change your life. It changes you. We serve the only God that become just like us. We're the only religion that, that serves a God that becomes just like us, which is the true and the living God. And so, so God, God became sin, who knew no sin, that you and I could obtain his righteousness. And so, so we see that at the cross of Calvary. We understand that. Why do we understand that? Because we've been enlightened and we've been taught. And that's why it's important. If you notice anything in your life, if, if, if you live in your parents, with your parents and with your grandparents, things that you learn when you're little is something that is in your life like an oak tree. Buddy, I mean, it takes a lot of wind to blow an oak tree down. I've seen oak trees get blown over by the wind sometimes, and they pull up about... Uh, I don't know, 20 feet of dirt with them when the wind blows them over because a stump, I mean, the, the tap root goes deep with the oak and it's got a big, the water roots go way out and I see the, a tree blowed over where it's like sandy soil and white clay, a, tr a oak tree will not blow over in white clay. But in sandy soil, it will blow over. And, and I've seen them that they have 15, 20 foot of stump. I mean, going up in the air with roots that pull that. And, and, and so stuff that gets anchored in your life when you're a kid, like... I've always been a Baptist because my mom and dad was a Baptist. See, when now, if you go to somebody that's Islam, that's Islam all their life, that's all they know. They're like that oak tree. They're like me as a Baptist. They're like, they're like uh, somebody that's a Buddha. And, and, and that's something that's get rooted in your life. Now, what does it take to remove that in their life? You ever, you ever try to witness to somebody that is Islam? I did. I, I worked with O. Abdullah at work, man. Talked to him about Christ, and he was a he was Islam guy. But you know what? He was raised like that when he was a kid, just like I was raised as a Baptist. You get somebody that's raised a Catholic, uh, I don't care what religion they are, it's like an oak tree in their life. you got to get past that in order to witness to them, to make them convert to a Baptist if you want them to be a Baptist. And it takes a lot of work. That's why the Bible says you teach a kid when he's young, and then when he gets old, he will not depart from it. 
So the things that we learn in our youth is very critical. If you, if you learn it the wrong way, then you, it, 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 it's bad for your life. And if you know this, if you try to do something, you, you try to learn it the wrong way, buddy, it's hard to unlearn something. You ever tried to re- re- rework your life in, in areas in your life where you need to rework it? It is the hardest thing you will ever do is try to unlearn something and try to do it another way. And, uh, and, 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 and people that are set in their ways, uh, it's, it's hard to move them, but they can be moved. Now, he says, though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. Aren't you glad of that? God is high and exalted. He comes to the lowly of heart. If you're humble and you're uh, have have a have a, a, a sweet spirit about you, you know God comes to that heart. God God reckons with that heart, and God deals with it, even though we're lowly. God loves someone. He said, "The meek and lowly shall inherit the earth." You know, and and so God wants me and you to inherit the, the blessings that He has. He says, but the proud he knoweth afar off. What's, what's being proud? See, proud is something that you're not willing to change. You know, I know better. You know, uh, you see something that needs to be tweaked in your life, but you're too proud to tweak it. You know, God wants to move you a little bit. And maybe you need to repent of some things, but you're too proud to come to God and say, God, I was wrong in that area of my life. See, God said he knows the proud afar off. The Bible says that God hates pride because pride is going my own way. And God hates it when we go our own way because God has a pattern of life. God has a blueprint to life. And you cannot detour, you cannot deviate from that blueprint. That God has put out. God does not change his ways. God is the same today, tomorrow, forevermore. God does not change. God has a pattern for every single one of our lives. And, and it's like a blueprint. And so God wants me and you to follow that pattern. But a lot of times, the Bible calls it, Jeremiah calls it, a plumb line. You know, God has laid a plumb line out for your life. And God has blessings on that plumb line. But what do we do? We... Sometimes we stray away from that plumb line. We get off on our own way. And God takes us in a circle. We come back to the plumb line. But most of the time when you get out away from God and you start going your own way, you'll come and end up right back where you started from. And then God wants you to repent. And God wants you to get back on the plumb line. And so as, as we go through uh, 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 forms of worship in our life and as we go to church and as we do the things that, that God allows us to do as Christians, a lot of times, things become habitual. They become a habit. Now, you start going to church. You can fall into going to church by habit. And when you start coming to church by habit, what happens? You just come into church just to come to church. i got to go to church. Well, it's something to do. Well, I, it's something I ought to do. And you start going to church that way, and you, you lose you lose the reason why you come into the worship place. See, we come here. You don't come here to serve God. You come here to worship God. You serve God once you go through the door out there. That's where you serve God. You worship him in here. And so if we come into this place this morning with the heart that we want to exalt God. See, I have a little piece of God. You have a little piece of God. God is a spirit. So when when our little pieces get stirred up, it's like water moving. You know, a l- one raindrop can't cause too much damage. But you get 10 trillion raindrops together, they can cause some damage. See, one little moving of the Spirit might not do too much for the church. But you get 20 or 30 people moving in the Spirit, things happen in the church. See, and it's like that's where the blessings come down. The showers of blessing comes down. The rain comes down from God. Gary, you want to say something? Okay. But God wants me and you to be exalted. God wants, God wants to exalt us, but he also wants us to exalt him. God wants us to worship him. God is a spirit, the Bible tells us, and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
But God knows the proud afar off. God, God will, if a, a man is proud, God will let him be a proud man. You know, if you're proud, God will let you be proud. He's got a lot of patience. He's got a, long, a lot of long-suffering. Pride separates us from God because pride eventually is going to end in, 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 in things that end your life that is going to be contrary to what God wants you to do. And once you know to do good and you don't do that good, then the Bible tells us it's sin. And so sin enters into the picture, and we know the wages of sin. It's death. And see, so God can take all the blessings in your life that he was going to give you, and it could be as though it was nothing. It could be death to you. Because why? Because you have backslidden or you turned your back on God. And so, so God, God, he knows the proud, but he knows them afar off. See, the world, the world does not know God anyway. The people of the world does not even know God. The, the we serving God is foolish to the people that serve the world. They're, it's foolish to them. And the Bible tells us that. They don't understand it. The only way that you can love God is to know God. That's the only way you can love him. You can't love somebody you don't know. Now, people know of God, and you could somewhat say you love God if you know of God. There's a difference than knowing of God and knowing God. See, I know about Obama, President Obama. I know of, I know of him. I don't know him. I've never personally shook his hand. I've, he's never been personally introduced to me. So I, I know of him. I do not know him. And so that's a way a lot of people know God. They know of God, but they don't know God. See, you've got to know who God is. God has got to reveal himself to you. And, and when, he, when he reveals himself to you, let me tell you something. He takes the pride out of your heart. He takes that hardness of your heart away, and he puts a heart of flesh in there that can understand and that can feel. And you can feel the compassion and the love and desire that you need to serve God. Any comments? Let's look at uh, 7 through 8. He said, though I walk in the midst of trouble, and a lot of times that's talking about in the midst of the sea. And a lot of times you see that trouble in the sea. You, if, you, if you ever read it, God made us come through the sea. You know, God made them to come through the Red Sea. God makes them to come through trouble. See, out of a troubled heart becomes a heart of passion because God's got to take you through something in order for you to understand something. So he said, though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thy hand against the wrath of my enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect, perfect that which uh, concerneth me. Thy mercy, O God, endure forever. Forsake not the works of thy own hands. Now, God is doing a work. God's got a short work upon this earth. God has got a short work in every single life that is set here in these pews this morning. God's got a work. God's working on you, whether you know it or not. God's working on me. Uh, and God has a work in our lives. But God wants me and you to be able to go through the circumstances, to go through the trials, to go through the tribulations. We go through the trouble in our life. Trusting God. Now, when God puts you through a trouble, when God puts you uh, through a circumstance or a trial or a temptation, whatever God puts you through when you're going through it, God already knows what you can take. God already knows that. And God said, I will not put nothing upon you that you are not able to handle if you're a child of God. So if God is going to put you into a circumstance God is going to walk with you through that storm of that circumstance to come out on the other end. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. And so David recognized that. David said, in the midst of his trouble, he will revive me. What does revive mean? It's like putting a battery on a battery charger. You ever have a battery get weak and it wouldn't start your car? You put it on a battery charger, you revive it. You have to revive that battery. And sometimes you have to physically uh, 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 take a battery, flush it out, put new acid in it, put it on the charger, recharge it. You revive that battery. You made it almost a new battery. That's what God does to you. That's what God does to me. A lot of times my ways 
are not God's ways. And sometimes I get some drudge in my life or some, the Bible says that uh, uh, like gold, when it's melted, you get the dross off the top of the gold and you make it pure gold. A lot of times God does that. God allows me and you to go through things. God, God uh, puts us in the heat or puts us in the furnace of affliction or whatever God puts us through. He's doing all this to get the impurities out of you and out of me. And this is why God does that. And God says, and he will revive you. Revive means to renew, to make alive. Uh, we have revivals. Why we have revivals in a church? Because we want to get recharged in the spirit of God. We want to move up to where we, are, we once was with God. Uh, because the church sometimes, we, we get slack. And, and, and people do this naturally. Once you start doing things, and we see this in the Old Testament, when Israel was prospering, they turned their back on God. Just about every single time when God took them to the mountaintop, it wasn't very long, they was back down in the valley. Because they went up one hill and down the other. Because God was dealing with the flesh. Well, the flesh has not changed, folks. It's still the same way. The flesh will serve God sometimes when, when, it's, when bad things happen in their life. Oh, my gosh, I've I, I got to get back to the church. I've got to get back to where, where I need to be with God. I see people, I go to hospital, visit people, and you visit them. Oh, my, when I get out of here, man, I'm coming to church. Well, you go have prayer with them, and they get out of there, you never see them. They don't come to church. They get better. And, and that's the way the flesh is. The flesh only serves God like a spare tire. It uses God when it's convenient. See, with your spirit, you serve God with your wholeness. See, with your flesh, you serve God with partiality, his parts. You'll give God what, what you want to give God, and then you keep what you want to keep with your flesh. And so, so God knows that. God has to change us, and God has to revive us. And he says, thou stretch forth thy hand against the wrath of my enemies. And thy right hand shall save me. Now, a lot of times we look at enemies, and David's enemies was on the outside. And we know that. It was the little countries that come against Israel that wanted just to totally annihilate them from the face of the earth and that hated them uh, because if they said they, they were God's people. And, 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 and there was a lot of little countries that hated them. And so they, they would come against them. Now, we do not have enemies like that today, folks. Your enemies are not physical. We do not fight against flesh and blood. Men and women are not our enemies. The wicked spirits, the powers of darkness, wickedness in high places, it is a spiritual witness that comes against you to destroy your spirit from doing what God allows it to do. That's what the devil's job is. See, when you try, when God speaks to your heart, wants you to do something, brother, the devil's going to use your flesh to convince you why you shouldn't do it. And you're going to have to crucify your old self in order to do what God wants you to do because he will not let no flesh glory in his presence. That's what God, God wants you to recognize. You don't worship him with your flesh. You worship him with your spirit. And God wants your soul. Your soul and your spirit is what God is after because it came from God. Our flesh comes from the earth. It is earthy. And nobody's going to heaven in their flesh. Nobody. And we know that because we see everybody in a casket. Your flesh is going to go back to from the dust which it come. But the person that's in you that makes you motivate and makes you move and makes you think, that belongs to God. And what belongs to God has just got a body shell. That's all it's got. But this body's going to go down someday. But what's on the inside of me is going to live forever because it belongs to God, and it is of God. So our enemies come from within. My enemies are not on the outside. My enemies are on the inside of me. See, and I have told you several times that your worst enemy is you. My worst enemy is me. See, you can't stop me from doing the will of God. But I can. I can stop myself from doing the will of God. And, and so, so God wants me and you to recognize that. And, and, and so the, our enemies are spiritual enemies. They are not physical. David's was physical. David, he, God is showing us in the physical what he wants me and you to see in the spiritual. Now he said, and the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O God, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thy own hand. 
Now, who's working in you? Your Christian life, is it the work of you or is it the work of God? Is God working a good work in you or are you working a good work in you? See, it's, it's, it's like a yoke, a yoke fellow. David said, uh, certainly certain God, he said, he's my yoke fellow or he's my uh, soldier in Christ or he's my uh, uh, laborer in Christ. That's how, that's how David recognized Timothy and all these guys that, Tim, uh, that, that, that Paul worked with. You and I are yoke fellers with Jesus Christ. We are yoked to him. He said, yoke yourself to me. Uh, and, and we are yoked up with him. This is why we're yoked up to him. I got in the era of horses and mules when I was born. That's all I know. But my dad, when he was a kid, my grandpa had oxes. And there's a big old yoke in the barn. I never knew what it was. I never seen a yoke uh, of oxen. But my grandpa did. He had oak, uh, uh, oxen. But he had a big yoke that hung in the barn. And so, so then they would explain it to you this way. You would always, when, the, when you had a big ox, and, and an ox was just a big cow. That's what it was. But it was, a bigger, it was a bigger animal than a milk cow. And so they would take an old ox that know all the commands. And he would he do exactly what you commanded him. They would put a young ox that didn't know nothing about how to pull a plow or anything. They would yoke him to an old ox. Well, it don't make no difference if that young ox knew anything or not. That old ox is going to pull him. Wherever that old ox went, because he's a lot bigger than the young ox, he's going no matter what. And they would always tie their tails together because, you know, that uh, an ox, all they have is that thing around their neck and, and there's nothing to hold them in. And so if you don't tie their tails together, then the, the, the young ox would try to get away and he'd break his neck because he would twist and that yoke around his neck would break his neck. And so they would equally yoke them together with an old ox and that old ox would train that young ox. And eventually when the master said whatever word he said for him to go, he would go. If he said G, he would, you know, he would go to the right. If he said haw, he would go to the left. And, 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 and by command, after a while, because that old ox was a lot bigger than that young ox, and he would, he would go that way. Well, in Christ, who's bigger in you? You or Christ? Because when you're yoked with him, one of you is going somewhere. And that's a fact. Now, wherever you go, whatever you do, Christ is going with you. If you've been born of the Spirit of God, I don't care what you do, I don't care what you say, I don't care where you go or who you hang out with, Christ is hanging out with you. Because he's yoked with you. And he is trying to train you. But see, a lot of people is trying to train their Christ. Christ, I don't want to go the way you're going. I want you to go the way my, I go. And a lot of Christians are trying to mold Christ into their life. And see, it don't work. If, you, if you're that way, you are a weak Christian. And, and, and you cannot do the things of God because you're not listening to what is inside of you. The younger has to dominate the elder. Emory Jones has to submit himself to the Christ that's in me. Because I didn't get him until I was 14 years old. See, so I have to serve him. I have to exalt him. I have to listen to him. And see, when I'm yoked with him and if I listen to where he tells me to go, then God could bless us. See, sin comes into your life. You, you wonder sometimes, man, why don't God just take that person out of this world? But you know, God's love goes deeper than that. God understands me in my flesh. God understands Emory Jones. But if God was to destroy Emory Jones, he destroys the Christ that's in me. See, God always has hope. God always knows where the Christ is going. God always knows what mission he's got. And so, so God, God sometimes looks over what we do because he's looking at the Christ that's in you. And see, God, God wants to exalt him. And God wants to allow him to grow in our life. He is formed in our life. And, and God grows him. And he grows in our life. The more you become like Christ, the more you become like God. The more you understand the Christ that's in you, the more you understand the God that sits on the throne in heaven. See, people try to serve a God that's far distant away. Well, God's right inside of us. He's right here, right near. When you pray, where do you pray to? You pray to what's in you. 
And, and, and that yoke is getting more equally yoked together to where you become obedient and where, be, where you could become a place where you, you're proud, your proudness just flies away and, 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 and you become humble before God. And that's what God wants from us. Any comments? That concludes our study this morning.